I'm really excited to share with you guys some of the cool stuff we've been doing at Battlefy, especially around automated front end testing. Um, excellent. So, as we all know, sharing is caring. Um, if you guys want to tweet, you can easily uh, uh, hashtag VanQ on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, and uh, definitely mention that Battlefy. Um, so, uh, I'm Jamie. I'm a software engineer at Battlefy. I joined about six months ago, and I believe in always be coding, ABC. Um, and what is Battlefy? Battlefy powers the esports industry. So, what is esports? Uh, tournament brackets, communications, organizations and leagues, teams, players, statistics, and social connections. All competitive online gaming. And we support over 50,000 games, and even, yes, there's a game called Firecat, and it is competitive. Um, so, just to kind of dive into like the, how big esports is growing right now. So, this is a picture of the Dota International 2014 uh, Championships. So, the prize pool here was uh, $10.9 million. Um, the Super Bowl prize pool was $9.9 .9 million. And the, the prize pool for the Masters Golf Tournament was $9 million. So, just to kind of put this in perspective, esports itself is growing at an astronomical uh, rate at the moment. And here's another picture of the 2014 World Championships of League of Legends. It's another uh, multiplayer online battle game where five people versus another five people uh, from different countries. Uh, this is taken in South Korea. Um, the viewership for the finals was 27 million viewers. Uh, for the World Series, uh, baseball was 15.8 uh, million viewers, 18.14 million viewers for the NBA Finals, and 6 million viewers for the NHL Finals. So you can see like, there's a lot of viewership going to esports, and there's a lot of money going to esports now. Uh, and it's a really, really exciting time uh, for Battlefy to be in this space. Oh, what's up? Um, Amazon recently bought Twitch TV for a billion dollars. And Twitch TV is an online competitive gaming streaming website. Okay. Uh, so, automated front, front end testing. So once upon a time, well, six months ago, uh, we had some serious issues. We were uh, a six-person engineering team. Uh, we had two-week-long sprints, and, so, and most of the time, our sprint planning sessions were very long because we'd have our whole entire team uh, at the start of a sprint, and then <laughs> after two weeks' worth of work, we would be like, all right, let's integrate and ship. This is pretty ridiculous, actually, because our changes were so large that everybody was pretty much not that confident about shipping that to production. Um, code reviewing this large pull request going into production would take hours because there would be such a large change. And as well as we were looking for tools where we can test directly. So our front end application is built on AngularJS. Uh, it's pretty common to use Karma and this way of testing directives, passing in inputs, and then uh, compiling the templates. But we wanted to be able to make it so that our designers were not hamstrung by uh, writing a lot of code for testing certain templates or testing certain ways of optimizing the UI. We definitely use a lot of mixed panel nowadays where we can make certain funnels go from like six steps to two steps. Uh, for example, our tournament creation process used to be six uh, steps and we actually analyzed the funnel, uh, redesigned the, 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 the the UI to be two steps, and that definitely increased a lot of our user engagement. So we do a lot of experiments, we change the UI at all times, and uh, we wanted to be able to provide that kind of environment for our UI developers to change it quickly, uh, without uh, essentially breaking functionality. Excellent. Um, uh, so our old delivery process was, you know, everybody would branch off the, branch off the feature branch, we use GitHub, uh, everybody would integrate and develop, Awesome, and we have a two-week sprint, so everybody would be con uh, continuously integrating into develop. We'd have Jenkins running, and then when we feel confident about going at the end of the sprint, deploying the sandbox, we deploy it, and then we manually test. Yes, manually test. We actually had a few Firefox driver like Selenium tests right at the same time, but we found ourselves actually running uh, writing uh, the tests. We were spending a lot more time writing the tests than actually writing the feature, or like wrestling with Firefox more and uh, like race conditions and whatnot. Uh, because our front end application is a bit of a beast. Um, it is a single page application. Uh, it's not like a traditional application where you have an underlying backend where you have Rails, Node, or like whatnot. Uh, it is just a single page application, a static website that you can ship. 
uh, anywhere actually. If you could ship it to uh, an S3 bucket, then it would run. And then it would talk to our API through uh, cores. Uh, so, sorry, uh, once we would do a pull request in the master, that large, that large change set, set would show up in uh, GitHub and we do a code review. And then once we code reviewed that, spent hours doing that, we would deploy the standard blocks again and then manually test those flows on standard blocks. And when we were finally confident with that, which we weren't that confident because we did so much testing and everybody's kind of burnt out, uh, we would deploy it to production. And uh, so, well, like, what, did, what did that really feel like? Sorry, is that playing for you guys? Yeah. Did that play? Wait, did it? Okay, yeah. So, Wait, yeah, exactly. So this meme pretty much describes uh, what it felt like to deploy to uh, production. Um, we wanted to change certain things. Uh, obviously, we were getting regressions. Uh, every like, we believe that you know time is a resource for sure, but for sure, morale is also a resource. And as you continue to do a lot of manual tests as a small team of six engineers, it gets pretty cumbersome. So that said. Um, Times change. So this photo, like this is Garrosh uh, Hellstream. And he's actually the guy in World of Warcraft that goes back in time to provide state of the state of state of the art technology to the past orcs and he, and he changes the destiny of the past orcs and goes off in a totally different timeline. So you're probably wondering how is this related? Well, um, when Loyal Chow demoed Screener to us, it was almost the same feeling. So uh, I'm going to dive into Screener and how it does automated testing, but essentially we wanted to be able to move faster, reduce risks, uh, but also give our designers the ability to change things at freely, but know about these changes that are going on to production. Uh, so six months ago, uh, manual testing, only a few like Firefox service landing tests, manual deployments, reduced confidence, reduced uh, productivity, and now today we have continuous delivery using Docker, Elastic Beanstalk, Jenkins, like all the good stuff, uh, feature flagging as well to reduce more risk and increase confidence and productivity. But today I'll be talking about how we do automated change detection with Screener. Awesome. Uh, so just taking a step back here, our core goals as an engineering team for front-end automated testing were uh, we want to be able to write and execute tests really, really, uh, really quickly. So uh, jumping in, writing Java for, for, the, uh, for, for some of the Selenium stuff uh, as uh, node developers was kind of like, eh, I'm not really sure we should be doing that. Um, uh, number two, increase team collaboration and ownership of features. So one thing we wanted to do is we want to have a tool where we can bring in the whole team, sales, uh, product management, design, and engineering, so we can be like, okay, these changes are actually going out to production, and that our sales guys can be talking to some of our customers and be like, yeah, certain buttons changed up here because uh, we wanted to make things easier for you. Uh, number three, ensure that anyone can write tests. So this is kind of a mind-blowing aspect, and you'll probably see this in the screener demo that I'm going to do in a second. Uh, but yeah, we definitely wanted to make it so that anybody could write tests. Uh, you could be in sales, you could be in product management, you don't have to be an engineer to do it. And the ability to parallelize tests. So we want to be able to, so our current environment is continuous delivery, uh, we're always shipping, and we want to be able to do this really, really fast. But uh, across multiple browsers, multiple screen resolutions, and multiple environments, in case we want to deploy a certain feature to a different environment, or test out with a certain set of users. Excellent. So I'm going to just hop out and hop into my browser. Hopefully you guys can see um, it. I'm just going to mirror the displays. Oh, How's, that's uh, pretty bad. Eh? <laughs> OK, I'm going to not mirror the displays. OK, what's on that main one OK, well, well that's going to be tough. Okay, I'm going to have to marry the guy who married this. Okay. So, um, Screener, uh, for us, we can basically use the uh, Chrome extension. So all you really have to do to get started here is use a Chrome extension and go ahead and start writing steps on how you go about functionally testing your application. 
Uh, as you can see here, step one, take a screenshot, uh, click on an element, choose a game, um, click another element, set some input text, and then off you go. It's very, very intuitive, very easy to use. Uh, and so when you demoed it to us, we were like, well, you know, if all we need is a Chrome extension, this is fantastic. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in and create a, uh, this is one test room that you can e easily play. And so this was written in less than an hour. And essentially what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and play back what uh, it's like to uh, create a Hearthstone tournament in, in an automated fashion. And I think I'm just having an internet problem right now. Uh-oh. It's a test. Uh, Do you remember? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think it times that around 10 minutes or something like that. functionally test your application with, uh, it'll just go ahead and run through the steps. I really apologize for the resolution here, but it's actually highlighting on the bottom here which step it's clicking on, moving towards it, and taking screenshots along the way. And every time it flashes the screen, you'll be able to see um, that it's taking a screenshot. Now you're probably thinking, well, is this just Chrome? Well, actually, since these steps are just building up like a JSON uh, an array, it basically sends that, it, that JSON uh, to the Screener API, and the Screener API is able to spin up more uh, different browsers at different resolutions, uh, depending on what you want. So if you want IE uh, 9, 8, 10, uh, Firefox 20, uh, you can easily choose that from the UI, and it'll just spin up those boxes and do it for you. The good thing is that as a test writer, you're basically in this Chrome extension and you're just running it uh, as any other user. Like click on this, type in this, and then off you go. Um, here it's already playing through, it's creating a round robin, it already added the players, and then after that it's done. Um, that's pretty much it. And then uh, it'll report the results back into our Slack channel. So we use Slack as a communication tool, but also we use Jenkins to drive our deployments to our pre-production environments. And then once that's done, it kicks off the screener test to test the pre-production environments. Um, and then here, I'm just going to show you guys another one for Pokemon, uh, which is another popular uh, tournament game that we have on our platform. So here's just going to go ahead and put some, some data in, and create the tournament. And in this, test one, in this test one, it'll actually create a Swiss uh, bracket. And then it'll actually try to report the scores against that, and then it'll take screenshots along the way. So you're probably wondering, why is it taking screenshots? Well, since we're moving so fast, and uh, we do about four to, four to ten deployments a day, we basically want to make a, a difference between what has changed from the last version that was deployed to the pre-production environment. Um, it's okay that bugs are moving around, as long as everybody's okay with that change, essentially. And functionally, that it doesn't break. You see here, it's already reporting the scores, and then moving over, generating another round. Um, that's yes. And it's pretty fast, actually, from, from a test writing perspective. pretty much the result screen. Uh, as it went through and reported the, the scores for each match, uh, you can see Justin won, won first place, and third place. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to jump back in the keynote here.
So I demoed the uh, the uh, the screener tool um, as a test writer, but also um, as it kind of goes through and takes screenshots, you're able to see it uh, running. But also, it has a lot of different integration points, like uh, wiring it to Jenkins, but also reporting the same results into your Slack channel or even HipChat or I guess uh, any other chat that supports webhooks. So it's, it's, a, it's a really flexible tool to be able to communicate those results to any one of your teammates. Uh, here, so change detection. Um, you can see here that the form just moved up three rows, uh, and it's able to detect that and say it's gone from the previous version over there, but then moved up in the new version uh, because we want to make it so that users can select the, um, that form field quicker. Uh, there's also an approval history, so when you go through the screenshots that have changed, uh, some of your teammates can be like rejected, you can reject the screenshot and also accept them, and then you'll be able to know who did what um, from uh, a his historical perspective. <coughs> and here's a, a, a picture of our smoke test uh, channel in, in Slack. Uh, we basically have all the changes being funneled into uh, slots so that we can easily uh, react to them if it does detect any changes. So overall, like right now, uh, we've, we've massively changed our, our delivery process. Uh, while the first part is we, we, we still continue to do uh, feature branch, uh, we use GitHub, but we, we use a lot more, uh, or, uh, we use uh, continuous delivery by deploying our Docker containers to a pre-production environment. And we basically have Screener hitting those uh, pre-production environments all the time uh, to detect any changes that uh, are about to go out the door. And once those are all approved, as a team, we can basically make tag a release, and then off that goes to production. Uh, so in this talk, I've like, I pretty much showed like how we've evolved from like six months ago having low confidence, not being able to. Uh, uh, have the confidence to ship uh, two weeks worth of work because the change sets would be so large, like 200 files changed, and it would take so long to code review it. Um, every time we deploy, uh, we'd find a bug, and then we'd hot fix it, and then we'd go through the rounds again for manual testing. But with, uh, with Screener and all of our continuous delivery, we're actually able to have all these small changes streaming into production all the time, where the risk is very small, but also the changes are very small as well. Oh, well, of course. Uh, as a small team, we're also growing. Uh, we're uh, 11 people now, six engineers, and we're always looking for people that are doing Node.js, uh, Mongo, Elasticsearch, Neo4j, Redis, uh, and front end, uh, AngularJS, one of HTML5, uh, CSS3. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so you've gone from a kind of a ragtag process to a pretty complex process. Did you bring in somebody from the outside to kind of evaluate, or did you guys put your heads together and go, okay, this isn't working, we need to do something different, and you know, we got to do best practices? Absolutely. So the question was, like, do we bring outside help for this, or do we come together as a team and decide that like, things have to change, basically? Yeah. So yeah, we decided as a team things have to change because we're going through so much pain, and uh, the, the business wanted to be able to see results 
quicker. So we did switch from like two week long flatting sessions, two week sprints to Kanban, and then we basically chopped everything up and then we were able to stream those things into production uh, and then continually communicate to the business that uh, certain things are shipping and bug fixes are getting done. Uh, yeah. Great question. How do you guys track user stories and how do you make sure that um, your coverage is um, in line with your user stories um, and functionality as well? Right. Uh, so the question was uh, how do we track user stories and what do we do to verify the, the requirements based on the tests? Uh, so right now we actually have everything in Jira. Uh, everything is like, as a user, you should do this because my goal is to do this. And then we break those down into like technical tasks. And then those technical tasks have like uh, unit tests against them, service layer API tests against them, and uh, screener tests against them. Um, yeah, that's basically how we do it. And how do you keep a repository of tests? Oh, repository of tests. So uh, our, we ship our backend uh, separately from our front end, but our backend does have like a whole suite of API tests and unit yeah. tests against it, the models and whatnot. Um, and the front end, uh, we actually stopped using Karma and whatnot. We're actually just fully are using Screener because we want to be able to change the UI really quickly based on our mixed panel results. Because sometimes we might ship a UI that is like, it's, it's a little bit complex, but it's something that we want to experiment with. But then we, we track the funnel and then be like, okay, someone, it dropped off on the fourth step. How can we make this more simple? And then we optimize the UI or we redesign it and then we track it or we measure it. And then we just use Screener to be able to see like, did functionality change and what changed. Yeah. Great question. Uh, I'm interested in what's the process you before you take the screener, you evaluate other tools, and also I checked the website of the screener. Seems like they announced like a final release, they do have like the early access. So how stable is this tool so far? And uh, it's your experience. Oh, uh, well, actually, uh, the founder of screener. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, from our experience, well. Loyal has been absolutely awesome in, in regards to communicating uh, like the feature set and the things that we've been working with. Like, uh, he's got a lot of enterprise customers to, to work with where they move a little bit slower, but as a startup, we do, we do continuous delivery, we have a ton of tests, and we're always changing. For our use cases, uh, we needed something to be really fast and flexible and integratable into Slack, so the webhooks uh, for communication, as well as Jenkins for CI. Because uh, we use Jenkins pretty much for like deploying to different environments. So yeah, everything kind of like uh, aligned in terms of tooling and uh, the developer agility that we did get out of using Screener and integrating it, uh, it just worked. So it's, you have any kind of... Uh, sure, yeah, just around uh, the, in terms of Screener maturity. Um, we're a startup for, for like based on Angular. Uh, we've, we've been around for about 10 months. Uh, and we started our data um, uh, with with Battlefly uh, in May of last year. Uh, and like, we're, we're currently still in beta. I think we've got a few dozen beta customers in our kind of beta. Uh, and then we've, we've got a bunch of 1,000 customers as well. Uh, I got a small question. I got two small questions. Like, uh, one is regarding the data, uh, regarding for your automated test, and one is regarding the performance testing. Like, uh, how you manipulate the data, like what, what you give the input, like while giving the inputs, like uh, for example, if I run, I want to run it for 10 different users, like uh, how you differentiate between the, like, first to the last one. Right, uh, so the question was like, how do we persist the data between like different test runs, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually don't right now. Uh, the reason why is because we use uh, like uh, containerized deployments using Docker and we just wipe the whole entire environment out and then we just ship the containers up and then we hit the tests. Uh, yeah, we, <laughs> like essentially these tests actually have a little bit of data in them, like the, the player names, the team names, uh, the different bracket names. Start right hard coded kind of, like you can say like hard coded data in them. Inside the test, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, have you run it for the multi-user environment? Like for example, if you have multiple uh, people uh, running the same same thing, like for for for, for a single platform or something. Part, part of key, like uh, multi-user environment, like the ten people are collectively using your app website or web application for the service you are testing. Like, uh, is your tool able to do that? Uh, so, 
from the UI perspective, we do run a few test runs in parallel, but the, the, the paths don't. Yeah. Uh, performance thing. They don't overlap, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like what we specifically wrote that. Yeah, too. Um, so did you stop using Selenium altogether? Because the only tool we use using it this now? Uh, yeah, we ended up just doing that because um, we didn't want to write Java. But also, like uh, our, our designer and uh, our, our design team is really creative, and we, we as a startup, we want to be able to like move the UI, change the UI based on how users use the site, and we want to be like really, really quick about evolving that UI so that we can increase engagement right away, or like increase signups, or you know, increase the number of tournaments uh, created. Uh, so yeah, we're very much like metrics driven, and like if anything can increase those metrics, then we want to get that agility or use those tools that give us that agility to change. Also, uh, when you remember this, uh, this demo, it reminded me of Zoe's Slim ISP plugin for Firefox. I'm not sure if it's still is, but it was the same workflow, like you record your actions and then you can rerun them. Is it similar? Is it similar to what we did with the second one? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> So my question was basically, is it is uh, as it still similar, or is it completely different? Something that's something you could do differently. So the good thing is, is that uh, so when I use the Chrome extension, those steps like you, you walk through it and then you you uh, you set whatever text you want and you save it. The thing about this is that Screener has an API which will take those steps and then it'll spin up all the different resolutions you want to test and all the different uh, browsers you want to test, IE8, IE9, IE10, and even the like, different environments. You can, you can target specific uh, subdomains and whatnot. So there's a lot of like, really cool things that you get out of the box uh, when using Screener on, with the easy to use Chrome extension tool. Um, I think the Firefox thing doesn't have like, a whole back end that supports you in that way. I don't think that's really the only thing you can do is you can export this that's what you work into Uh, so I remember you were, yeah, your first time. Uh, I was wondering who is maintaining the test cases, and uh, if there is any change in the workflow, do you need to regenerate the test case? Uh, yeah, so the question was who writes the test cases? Yeah. And the second question was? <coughs> uh, any change in the workflow, do you need to regenerate all the test cases? Uh, okay, so who writes the test cases? Anybody on the team can actually write uh, uh, the test cases. So it comes from the mixed path side of things, like uh, figuring out what kind of goal you want for the user, uh, and then we create a UI on that, and then after that we say, okay, hey, all these forms can be filled out, and it has to be done by X amount of steps so that we can increase engagement. Um, like that's kind of like our way of doing the test cases. And then your second question was uh, like if there's changes to the workflow, uh, and that's the good thing about this too. Like you don't have to worry too much because it'll catch when uh, the DOM changes or like the content changes. Um, it can even catch underneath, uh, things underneath. So if you have like a modal dialogue that's sitting on top of uh, some other content, uh, since it does DOM differences, like you can actually catch things that are changing underneath. But from a human perspective, like you wouldn't even notice because it's a, it's a modal dialogue. Uh, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, continuing this question. Um, is there any reusability of the code? For example, you have the same page in 100 test cases and something changes dramatically on this page. Right. Do you need to update all 100 test cases or Ab just in one place? That's a good question. So the question was about reusability of the, the, the test cases and, and what we have right there. You can see like there's a lot of text that we're just typing in there. But actually, um, the way that we use Screener is just specifically inside of the, the Chrome extension. The thing is, is that uh, since they're just like the Selenium like JSON steps, you can actually use your existing Selenium tests from like whatever you have right now, export them into the JSON format, and then it'll actually do that for you. So like you don't actually have to use the Chrome extension at all. You can still use your existing Selenium tests, which are reusable and whatnot, and um, and, and plug it into the Screeners API. Uh, but for us, uh, we haven't actually been able to like, use it in a way that is more reusable. Uh, we just use by user role, like. Um, in our main suite, we've got like organizer creates a round robin bracket for Hearthstone. <coughs> organizer creates a League of Legends tournament with X amount of teams. It's like it's kind of very like specific. 
And uh, if there's specific workflows that worry on us sometimes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the question was like race conditions and like weight fours for certain elements and whatnot. The good thing is that I think underneath the hood is this Selenium. Uh, and so like there are actually commands inside the Chrome extension where you can say like wait for a certain element to show up and then click it. So uh, it's pretty intuitive from that perspective. From like since our application is so heavyweight on the front end, like there's no underlying back end, it's just talking to like an API. Um, from our perspective, our biggest hurdle so far has has been um, uh, some of our admin features where like there's a lot of data loading at the same time uh, or things being hidden. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain because there's so much stuff happening inside of a, like a bracket, uh, like a, a 1,000 team bracket, that uh, sometimes it might time out, uh, like 30 seconds. Can I uh, understand that it's the same mechanism that is Right, uh, underneath the hood. Yeah. Built on on top of Selenium actually. Uh, probably, we, we tried to, to simplify a lot of Selenium uh, for Joe. So, for example, in the reporter, if, say, a button is not visible yet, it's waiting for a cache calls to happen, uh, we'll actually add default gates so that you don't have to add so much code to your reporter. Um, but, uh, but, but the reporter is mainly for kind of getting up and running quickly. Uh, and, and like for use cases such as what I don't want to ask. Like, like, like in some cases, if, if you need to get that already in the database, or, or if you want a page object to use functionality, you know, in a bunch of different places, uh, we, we typically suggest to, to actually write in Selenium. And, and, the, and the Screener API uh, integrates fully into Selenium. Uh, for coming out. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>